from picnics to planets to solar systems to galaxies and back again, all the way into the atomic nucleus. A very wild ride. Hang on. It's science without walls. It's time to expand and contract, mentally, that is. We're going to expand in scale, to see, to visualize galaxies. And we're going to contract, get miniaturized, get small and smaller, to visualize cells and molecules and even the insides of atoms. We move from systems and models to our third key concept, scale. And we're now going to experience many orders of magnitude, many powers of 10 in distance, to really appreciate the extent of the natural world. The concept and nature of scale and dimension is beautifully illustrated in a wonderful film called Powers of 10. This film was made many years ago using what were, at that time, advanced graphics and computers to provide a very rapid and effective experience in dimensions, ranging from the interior of the nucleus of the atom to the farthest reaches of the universe. Give the next eight minutes your most concentrated attention. It will be very fast moving and very effective. Hang on. Here comes Powers of Ten. <laughs> The picnic near the lakeside in Chicago is the start of a lazy afternoon, early 1 October. We begin with a scene one meter wide, which we view from just one meter away. Now every 10 seconds we will look from 10 times farther away, and our field of view will be 10 times wider. This square is 10 meters wide, and in 10 seconds the next square will be 10 times as wide. Our picture will center on the picnickers, even after they've been lost to sight. 100 meters wide. The distance a man can run in 10 seconds. Cars crowd the highway. Power boats lie at their docks. The colorful bleachers are soldiers' field. This square is a kilometer wide, 1,000 meters. The distance a racing car can travel in 10 seconds. We see the great city on the lake shore. 10 to the fourth meters, 10 kilometers. The distance a supersonic airplane can travel in 10 seconds. We see first the rounded end of Lake Michigan, then the whole great lake, 10 to the fifth meters. The distance an orbiting satellite covers in 10 seconds. Long parades of clouds. The day's weather in the Middle West. 10 to the sixth, a one with six zeros, a million meters. Soon the Earth will show as a solid sphere. We are able to see the whole Earth now, just over a minute along the journey. The Earth diminishes into the distance, but those background stars are so much farther away that they do not yet appear to move. A line extends at the true speed of light. In one second, it half crosses the tilted orbit of the moon. Now we mark a small part of the path in which the Earth moves about the sun. Now the orbital paths of the neighbor planets, Venus and Mars, then Mercury. Entering our field of view is the glowing center of our solar system, the sun, followed by the massive outer planets, swinging wide in their big orbits. That odd orbit belongs to Pluto. A fringe of a myriad comets too faint to see completes the solar system. Ten to the 14th. As the solar system shrinks to one bright point in the distance, our sun is plainly now only one among the stars. 
Looking back from here, we note four southern constellations, still much as they appear from the far side of the Earth. This square is 10 to the 16th meters, one light year, not yet out to the next star. Our last 10 second step took us 10 light years further. The next will be 100. Our perspective changes so much in each step now that even the background stars will appear to converge. At last, we pass the bright star Arcturus and some stars of the Dipper. Normal but quite unfamiliar stars and clouds of gas surround us as we traverse the Milky Way galaxy. Giant steps carry us into the outskirts of the galaxy. And as we pull away, we begin to see the great flat spiral facing us. The time and path we chose to leave Chicago has brought us out of the galaxy along a course nearly perpendicular to its disk. The two little satellite galaxies of our own are the clouds of Magellan, 10 to the 22nd power, a million light years. Groups of galaxies bring a new level of structure to the scene. Glowing points are no longer single stars, but whole galaxies of stars seen as one. We pass the big Virgo cluster of galaxies among many others, a hundred million light years out. As we approach the limit of our vision, we pause to start back home. This lonely scene, the galaxies like dust, is what most of space looks like. This emptiness is normal. The richness of our own neighborhood is the exception. The trip back to the picnic on the lakefront will be a sped up version, reducing the distance to the Earth's surface by one power of 10 every two seconds. In each two seconds, we'll appear to cover 90% of the remaining distance back to Earth. Notice the alternation between great activity and relative inactivity, a rhythm that will continue all the way into our next goal, a proton in the nucleus of a carbon atom beneath the skin on the hand of the sleeping man at the picnic. Ten to the ninth meters, ten to the eighth, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. We are back at our starting point. We slow up at one meter, ten to the zero power. Now we reduce the distance to our final destination by 90% every 10 seconds, each step much smaller than the one before. At 10 to the minus 2, 1 one hundredth of a meter, 1 centimeter, we approach the surface of the hand. In a few seconds, we'll be entering the skin crossing layer after layer from the outermost dead cells into a tiny blood vessel within. Skin layers vanish in turn, an outer layer of cells, felty collagen. The capillary containing red blood cells and a roughly lymphocyte. We enter the white cell. Among its vital organelles, the porous wall of the cell nucleus appears. The nucleus within holds the heredity of the man in the coiled coils of DNA. As we close in, we come to the double helix itself, a molecule like a long twisted ladder whose rungs of paired bases spell out twice in an alphabet of four letters the words of the powerful genetic message. At the atomic scale, the interplay of form and motion becomes more visible. We focus on one commonplace group of three hydrogen atoms bonded by electrical forces to a carbon atom. Four electrons make up the outer shell of the carbon itself. They appear in quantum motion as a swarm of shimmering points. At 10 to the minus 10 meters, one angstrom, we find ourselves right among those outer electrons. Now we come upon the two inner electrons held in a tighter swarm. As we draw toward the atom's attracting center, we enter upon a vast inner space At last, the carbon nucleus, so massive and so small. This carbon nucleus is made up of six protons and six neutrons. We are in the domain of universal modules. There are protons and neutrons in every nucleus, electrons in every atom, 
atoms bonded into every molecule out to the farthest galaxy. As a single proton fills our scene, we reach the edge of present understanding. Are these some quarks in intense interaction? Our journey has taken us through 40 powers of 10. If now the field is one unit, then when we saw many clusters of galaxies together, it was 10 to the 40th, or 1 and 40 zeros. A wild ride, a remarkable film, the perfect introduction to the concept of scale and to dimensions, from the very, very small to the very, very large. It is important to appreciate scale, to be able to mentally zoom in and out and have an idea of what you are seeing. You know that cells are littler and molecules are littler, that there are animals which you cannot see which have full organ systems that go through complete life cycles, just like you and me. And that there were once animals, and still are, as large as your house. We must also be able to scale, to zoom, mentally in time. The millionths and billionths of a second, that's the micro and nanoseconds, which govern the motions of individual molecules. The seconds, minutes, and hours, which govern our human motions, the decades which govern our lifetimes, the several hundred years of our nation, the several thousand years of our Native American predecessors, the several million years of our human ancestors and of the evolution of our species, and the several hundred million years of the features of our state, and even the several billion years of our planet. Scientific notation helps us with scale, with powers of 10. Let's say we want to do an experiment in which we want to observe something now and then observe it every second for a short time, then observe it maybe at 100 seconds, then at 1,000 seconds, and then at 10,000. We expect it to change rapidly at the beginning and then to change more slowly as time increases. And we want to present the results of that experiment visually or graphically. That's really hard to do on a linear graph. If I laid out the graph in units of 10, such as 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, I'd have to run that scale way down the street in order to get to my 10,000 seconds. Using scientific notation, we have a very slick and easy way of seeing it all. We do it in powers of 10. We don't use 10, 20, 30, 40. We use 1, 10, 100, 1,000 on the piece of paper. But since it's hard to write so many zeros in a small space, we have another way of expressing that. We call it a logarithm, or log for short. The log of 10 squared is 2. Of 10 cubed is 3. Of 10 to the fifth is 5. So the logarithm is a way of taking powers of 10 and making it seem linear. One, two, three, four, five. We plot the log of the number rather than the actual number. We even have special papers and scales to make it easy to plot and present our data that way. It gets a little trickier if we are talking about the logarithm of, say, 153 rather than 100. But we know how to deal with that. In fact, that's how we used to do calculations before electronic calculators many years ago. Back then, we had a device called a slide rule, and it works by expressing numbers in logarithms in powers of 10. Many of the calculations that you do on your calculator or in your computer today are done in exactly that same way. It's just that the details are hidden from you because of the clever programming and electronics which several generations of computer scientists and electrical engineers have built into those little boxes we call calculators and computers. Here's an old slide rule. Look at it carefully. The numbers are literally on a sliding scale. See that the distance from 1 to 2 
is larger than from 2 to 3. And the distance from 9 to 10 is smaller than from 1 to 2. It's a way of spreading out the short end and compacting the big end. We stretch out the small numbers and tightly compact the very big numbers. That's what logarithms do. The important thing is to appreciate that we can do this and that you can calculate the logarithm of any number. You just put that number into your calculator or computer, hit the log key, and out comes the logarithm. Let's try the number 153. You know it is 1.53 times 100, or 1.53 times 10 squared. And you know the logarithm of 10 squared is 2. The problem now is what is the log of 1.53? Well, we could calculate that manually, but let's just get it from a calculator. Input 1.53, hit the log key, and the answer is 0 0.18. If we had inputted 153, the log is 2.18. So when we add logarithms, it's the same as multiplying the real numbers. The log of 1.53 plus the log of 100 is 0 0.18 plus 2, or 2.18. So, the log of 153 is 2.18. The log of a number is its 10 exponent. We say that the logarithm has a base of 10. Logs are not just limited to exponents of 10. We can express logs in terms of numbers other than 10. You'll cover that in math classes. Here, we'll only use powers of 10. One good thing about doing calculations with slide rules a third of a century ago is that the slide rule can't give you very big or very small numbers. It only deals with numbers between 1 and 10. If your number is less than 1 or greater than 10, you have to estimate. So although I can find the number 1.53 on my slide rule, I can't find 15.3 or 153 or 15,300, or 0 .000153. They're just not there. They don't need to be there because powers of 10 are so easy to work with. So just think of all numbers as between 1 and 10 multiplied by a power of 10. It's easy. We're not going to be afraid of numbers in this course. We're going to use them, but we'll use them simply. We'll always know what's reasonable because we'll estimate. And we'll never give numbers more accuracy or more respect than they deserve. A semi-log graph is a lot like keeping the scrapbook for your kids or the scrapbook your parents have kept for you. When you were first born, your vital statistics were of interest daily. Your weight and length were probably measured daily for the first 10 to 20 days, then maybe weekly, then monthly. Birthdays were probably monthly for the first few months, then a first year birthday. From then on, we record our age in years. And finally, in our middle age, we sort of celebrate decades. Life is sort of a semi-log activity. Now let's apply some of our scaling skills to parts of biology. Why are living things the size they are? Biologists often talk about a scaling principle, a way of dealing with the relative sizes and shapes of animals. Can we have monster insects, for example? When we say an animal or plant is large or small, we usually mean larger or smaller than ourselves. Animals range from the submicroscopic to the whales and the dinosaurs. The log scale of the size of the living world, expressed in grams, covers 21 orders of magnitude, 21 powers of 10. From the very, very small, the bacteria, which weigh just picograms, to the whales, which weigh more than 100 million grams, that's 100,000 kilograms, and that's over 200,000 pounds, or 100 tons. Fortunately for the whale, most of that weight is supported by the buoyancy generated in water. We're all familiar with ants. How are you and I different from ants? 
Thomas McMahon, a professor at Harvard, tells us in this passage from his book on size and life. We differ from ants in many ways, but size is certainly an important difference. Important especially because of its consequences. For instance, ants could not use fire. For even the smallest possible stable campfire flame is larger than an ant. Keeping a wood fire burning would be quite beyond their capacity because ants are too small to get near enough to add fuel, which in any event they would be unable to carry. Ants cannot use tools. A miniature hammer has too little kinetic energy to drive even a miniature nail. Spears, arrows, and clubs, which depend on a suitable ratio of a kinetic energy to a characteristic surface area to do their work, would be ineffective at ant size. And ant size books would be impossible to manufacture or even to open because the thin pages would stick together owing to the intermolecular forces that are relatively powerful at that scale. In any event, reading would likely have few charms for ants because with their small size, they have very few brain cells. Of course, ants have enough neurons to do all of the remarkable things that ants normally do. But we modestly presume that in order for an animal to appreciate the joys of literature, it needs to be at least the size of a human being. And finally, to emphasize our great superiority to ants, they cannot wash themselves with water. The water droplets of a shower stream come in a certain minimum size. Droplets of even this minimum size would strike an ant like heavy missiles. Even if an ant tried to take a bath in a single drop, surface tension would interfere because the chitin of the ant's body is water repellent. If the ant did somehow manage to get into a drop of water, surface tension would make it difficult to get out again. The answer for the ant is to dry clean itself by rubbing particles of dry substances over its body and then scraping the particles off. There are certain advantages to being an ant, however. An ant can lift 10 times its own weight. It can fall large distances without injury. At a certain time in the lives of some ants, flying is possible by an awkward mechanism. This passage is based on the writings of J.B.S. Haldane, a British biologist. And this example demonstrates that size, scale, and ratios are very important, not only to you and me, but to ants and other small creatures. Let's do a dramatic nonlinear relationship Nonlinear means there's an exponent involved. We'll work with cubes. Any size really will do. These are part of a kid's block set. Here's one cube. Its side is L. Area, L squared. Volume, L cubed. Density is mass in a certain volume. Mass divided by volume. These cubes happen to weigh one and a half ounces, or roughly 40 grams. Their length is 4.3 centimeters. So their volume is the cube of that. That's about 80 cubic centimeters. And that gives us a density of about a half a gram per cubic centimeter. So let's say we want to scale up a little critter. We'll assume he has cube dimensions to keep the number simple. He's now the same dimensions and mass as our basic cube. And we'll double his size in each dimension. So he's twice as long, twice as high, and twice as deep. Area is now that 2L squared, which is 4L squared. And volume, yep, it's 2L cubed, which is 8L cubed. So when we fully double something, area increases by 4 and volume by 8. The big cube mass consists of 8 smaller cubes. So the mass is now up by eight times also. Well, eight is nearly 10, and that's roughly one power of 10. So very roughly, if you double all of the dimensions, you increase mass and volume by nearly 10 times. Interesting. For example, let's double you. Let's say you're five feet, four inches, 160 centimeters tall, like Mary McDonald here. 
Mary works with me in the Center for Integrated Science Education. Thanks, Mary, for agreeing to become distorted for science. Well, let's say yours and Mary's dimensions are roughly seven inches square, or about 18 centimeters square. Don't worry about my very rough estimates. So your approximate cross-sectional area and Mary's is about 18 centimeters squared. That's about 340 centimeters squared. Times a height of 160 centimeters gives a volume of about 55,000 cubic centimeters. Well, that's about 55 liters. A typical density of about 1.1 grams per cubic centimeter gives Mary a weight of about 130 pounds, or 60 kilograms. Well, now let's produce a macro Mary. Double her dimensions. Her average area is now roughly 40 centimeters by 40 centimeters, and she's nearly 11 feet tall, 320 centimeters high. If we go through the estimates, macro Mary's weight does not just double to 260 pounds. She now weighs 1,200 pounds. Macro Mary's over half a ton. That's what scaling did for her. So the only way Macro Mary will work is if her bones increase their area and she lowers her center of gravity. Otherwise, she'll always be falling over. So Macro Mary, or Macro U, starts to look like a personal little elephant. And that's why elephants are built like elephants and you're built like you and Mary. And other things are built the way they are. Things are their right size, and they're based on the fundamental scaling laws of science. So monster insects, not a chance. And macro Mary, nope, she'd have no resemblance to Mary. We had to spend this whole program on scaling because the concept is so incredibly important. So please do some personal scaling and take that Powers of Ten ride a few more times. Next time, we'll deal with the key concepts of constancy, change, and matter. Stay tuned.